so this PowerPoint goes over both chapters 9 and 10. They both have to deal with controlling microbial growth. Chapter 9 goes over controlling microbial growth out in the environment. So if we were going to want to kill bacteria on surfaces and on any other type of substances, that's kind of basic chapter 9. Chapter, nine. chapter 10 is controlling microbial growth in the human body. And so you would obviously not want to be spraying it with a type of disinfectant. And so a little bit different areas, but yet same basic idea. So chapter nine, all about controlling microbial growth in the environment. That should look familiar. And so we're gonna go over what are some basic terms, what are some considerations on which way to choose how we control microbial growth, and then the types of microbial control. There's a whole bunch of physical ways we can control microbes, and then there's a whole bunch of chemicals we can use as well. And then we'll kind of discuss what you choose and when. Now, in your book on page 260, there's a nice, you know, summary of some terms. I'm not going to go over every single term in here because you have that available to you. Um, I was just going to make note and I'm like about a couple because we a lot of people hear these two particular words all the time and they get them mixed around with each other. One is sanitization and sterilization. They both sound a little bit alike. But when you go into a restaurant, that's usually when you're hearing the word sanitization. And I'm like, which is not sterilization? Sterilization is destroying every microorganism and virus. So it kills everything. Sanitization is removing pathogens. It's not getting rid of all bacteria. It's more of let's keep everything as sanitary as possible, and as clean as possible, but you're not killing every single organism. Um, otherwise, you can always refer back to that table um, if you want to look up any other terms. But, and I'm like, when we're choosing various antimicrobial agents, and I'm like, there's a couple different ways that these things kill the organism. One is that they alter their cell walls and their membranes. Now, if the cell wall and or the membrane is somehow changed, and I'm like, they can't do their job, which means the cell membrane can't control osmosis anymore, which means water may get out that shouldn't, water may get in that shouldn't, and I'm like, and it can destroy the microbe. Also, contents could leak out. I'm like, if you have a destroyed cell wall and membrane, that's your outer protective shell. Things are gonna leak out, and also things are gonna get in. Also, various antimicrobial agents can kill microorganisms by damaging their proteins and their nucleic acids. Again, a protein's job, and that includes enzymes, is tied to its shape. Once you denature it, whether it's with a heat or whether it's a chemical, it can't do its job anymore. Uh, also, if you damage your nucleic acids, this is your DNA, it's the Na of the DNA, and I'm like, DNA can't make any more proteins. And I'm like, your basic blueprint is gone now. And so a lot of these, or these agents that are used to kill things somehow target the bacteria in one of these ways. Now, choosing the right antimicrobial for the job, our ideal antimicrobial is inexpensive because everyone, everyone likes things that are cheap. It works really fast because we're not patient. It's stable on a shelf, so we don't have to refrigerate it, we don't have to freeze it, we don't have to keep it warm. It is just stable at room temperature sitting on a shelf. And it's also harmless to humans, animals, and objects. You don't want to spray something that's going to damage something. Now, also when we're trying to figure out the right antimicrobial is we also have to figure out what site are we treating? What exactly are we treating with this antimicrobial? Are we trying to kill organisms on, some, um, on an animal? Are we trying to kill something that's in a warm environment? Are we trying to kill organisms that are on a really fragile object, you know, or is it a metal surface? Is it a plastic um, tube? And I'm like, you know, what is the site to be figured? I mentioned animals, so I had to do my shameless, here's my pup, <laughs> uh, and threw that in there. My kids will show up in another lecture. Uh, also, we also want to know what are the environmental conditions that we're using? Is it warm wherever we're trying to kill? Is it cold wherever we're trying to kill these organisms? That can affect how an antimicrobial works. Same thing, what is the pH of the area that needs that bacteria killed? Because that can also change uh, how that antimicrobial works. So we kind of have to know what's going on before we choose the right antimicrobial. 
And we also want to know what is the susceptibility of the microorganisms we're trying to kill. Are they easy to kill or are they hard to kill? So are they really susceptible to an antimicrobial or they are not susceptible, it means they are really hard to kill. And so we've got a couple different levels of disinfectants. High levels of disinfectants kill all pathogens. That even includes endospores, that will include viruses, but it includes all pathogens. And on my so the most resistant organisms. Intermediate level antimicrobials kill fungal spores, protozoans, uh, their cysts, viruses, and pathogenic bacteria, so the bad bacteria. And low level disinfectants that we're kind of using every day all day long can kill non-pathogenic bacteria, some fungi, some protozoas, some viruses, and I'm like, you know, still kills a lot of that. Um, a lot of our basic uh, disinfectants we use up in our lab are more of a low level to intermediate level disinfectant. Now, with our types of con microbial control, really there are two groups or two types. There's physical methods to kill or control microbes, and there are chemical methods to, to control microbes. So we're going to start talking about physical methods first. And one physical method that we can use to control microbes is using heat. Now, what the heat will do to microbes, it will change their proteins. They can't work. It will change their nucleic acids. We've changed their blueprints. And it also interferes with the cell membrane and the cell wall. Again, that lipid will liquefy, and the wall can start to fall apart and almost melt. Now, also with the heat, and I'm like, there are two types of heat. There's a moist heat and there's a dry heat. If you don't like the word moist, I will lie, this is not going to be a good PowerPoint for you. I use the word a lot. And I'm like, but moist heat is used to disinfect, sanitize, sterilize, and pasteurize. It is way more effective than dry heat. And so some examples of moist heat, again, it's anything that involves water and a high temperature. That includes boiling. What boiling does, it kills uh, vegetative or kind of dormant cells of bacteria, fungi, protozoan, most viruses. The however, boiling does not always kill endospore-making bacteria, protozoan cysts, and some viruses. And so, you know, kind of that original, uh, I was gonna say, some of, some of that first use of aseptic techniques, they realized that boiling instruments really did help. It does kill a lot of organisms, but it does not kill them all. Now, my little review of what temperature does water boil at in Celsius? And again, everything is easy in Celsius. But water in Celsius boils at 100 degrees, nice straight even 100 degrees Celsius. And again, it doesn't kill everything. However, what we can do is we can take boiling and step it up a little bit. And we can actually, it's called, it's autoclaving. I'm like, we can add pressure to this water and the air that it's in. And because of the pressure, we can increase that boiling temperature up to 121 degrees Celsius. That extra 21 degrees Celsius from the normal 100 degree boiling up to 121, and then maintaining that temperature for 15 minutes will kill your endospore bacteria, your protozoan cyst, and most viruses. And so I'm like, adding that extra pressure allows us to increase that temperature. Now, I'm like, this, there's a, definitely different sizes of autoclaves. This is one is showing a little tabletop one. We've got one here on the second floor in this building. And again, right next to where you keep all your lab coats is that big, huge, massive, uh, you know, silver machine. That is a big autoclave when we're having to autoclave a lot of material. Now, to ensure that the autoclave actually worked, there does have to be some type of indicator because you don't know when you press go, if you come back later, that it actually got up to the correct temperature for the correct amount of time. So we have we add indicators to show that it actually came up to that. Now, there are vials that can do that, that yes, it just goes in there, it has an indicator, a little endospore strip, goes in with everything else you're trying to, uh, to autoclave, and then after that 15 minutes, which, you know, Mike, to get up to that temperature and pressure and to maintain it for 15 minutes, usually the autoclave, and then cool back down where you can open it, it's usually about a two hour process. And I'm like, but after two hours, and I'm like, we can break the vial and to see what happens if 
you know, when the fluid, and I'm like, whether it's sterile or not, interacts with that endospore strip. If that medium is yellow, it means the spores are viable, which means your autoclave did not get up to the correct temperature or it didn't get up there for 15 minutes. And I'm like, if it's red, it means everything worked. Now, this can get putsy, and again, it's another expense. We now actually have tape. It looks just like masking tape, but it has kind of these fancy white lines. They're really pale. But these white lines, and I'm like, when they're at that autoclave temperature for 15 minutes, these really pale white lines undergo a chemical reaction, and they turn black. And so this is what the tape looks like after an autoclave. So masking tape, a roll of this type of indicator masking tape, a lot cheaper than trying to do all these vials. Another type of moist heat, there's that word again, is pasteurization. This is used when we're trying to kill organisms in various types of foods and beverages, like in milk and ice cream and yogurt and fruit juices. Now it does kill most pathogenic bacteria. I'm like, it's not sterilization. And I'm like, there are some heat tolerant microbes that do survive, but it does kill most. Now, if we wanted to kill all, we can actually take some of these uh, foods and beverages and actually go up to a really high temperature sterilization. We can actually cause these fruits and, or the fruit juices and beverages and foods um, to get up to 140 degrees Celsius but only for one to three seconds. Main reason, and I'm like, it gets up to an extreme temperature, but because it's a short amount of time, it doesn't have enough time to denature all the proteins in these foods. Otherwise it would change the flavor of the foods, but it's enough to get it up to a high enough temperature to kill the organisms and then come right back. Which is why I'm like, if you've ever seen milk sitting on a shelf, not in a refrigerator, you can buy milk on the shelf. And I'm like, I just saw it at Women's the other day. And I'm like, it's close to the milk, but I'm like, but it's not on the shelf. Reason why you can store milk on the shelf is that that particular milk has been ultra high temperature sterilized. There's no bacteria, which means there's nothing that's gonna make that milk go bad. And so it can stay on the shelf for a longer period of time. And I'm like, there are a lot of countries that don't have you know, adequate refrigeration to try to keep milk cold. And so they use that ultra high temperature sterilization to allow that milk just to sit at room temperature. Now, getting rid of the word moist, although it's up here again, but yes, and I'm like, then there's dry heat. Now, we use dry heat on materials that cannot be sterilized with moist heat. If we wanted to sterilize a powder, if we wanted to make sure there was no organisms, microorganisms in a powder, powder, you can't add water to that or it'll turn into a big clump. If you have a metal instrument, we don't want heat in water or it will start to rust and corrode. And so there are things that we can't use moist heat for. Now, since moist heat is more effective than dry heat, drier heat will require higher temperatures for a longer period of time to kill the same type of organisms. Now, easiest way for us to kill things using a dry heat is using our incinerators. We are gonna burn the organisms. Incinerating is a sure way of sterilizing our objects, which is why, yes, we have our incinerators in our lab. Now, we're gonna do opposite of heat, and we're gonna flip around to refrigeration and freezing. Now, when we start bringing that temperature down, that lower temperature decreases metabolism because all the chemical reactions are slower. And so you're gonna have slower chemical reactions, you're gonna have slower growth, growth, you're gonna have slower reproduction. And again, this is what we're doing when we're pulling out the plates out of our incubators and putting them in our refrigerator, is we're slowing them down. Now, in a refrigerator, most pathogens do stop growing. And I'm like, is, it just kinda keeps them so cold they're out of their happy zone for temperature, and I'm like, there is the however, there are still some organisms that can grow in a refrigerator. And I'm like, I can guarantee you've all pulled something out of the back of your refrigerator that was there for a few months and there was stuff growing all over it. That's because those pathogens, although they worked maybe a little slower in the refrigerator, and I'm like, they step still kept growing in a refrigerator. Now, if we wanted to freeze, various microbes to stop their growth. There is a difference between slow freezing and quick freezing. 
And I'm like, slow freezing is more effective at killing microbes than quick freezing. Main reason, when we slow freeze these microbes, that water that is in them has time to form ice crystals. Ice crystals are jagged and they will literally damage the cell walls to kill the organisms. Quick freezing, the water will freeze but not form those ice crystals and it doesn't always kill the organisms. It will stop their growth, but it doesn't kill them. Now away from temperature altogether, we're gonna do with, you know, what about if there's water or no water? Well, one, and I'm like, one sure way to stop or slow microbial growth is desiccation, which means drying. If we're removing the water, and I'm like, we don't have a growth, and I'm like, it inhibits growth. This is why lots and lots of organisms or lots and lots of specimens and lots and lots of fruits and vegetables, when they need to be maintained for long periods of time, are dried out. And I'm like, a dried piece of fruit, I'm like, can last a whole lot longer than a fresh piece of fruit. You remove that water from that whatever fruit or vegetable, I'm like, well, microorganisms can't survive either without water. And so remove the water, it kills the microorganisms. And then there's the lyophilization, which is freeze drying. And I'm like, it's used for long-term preservation of microbial cultures. So it stops microbial growth. But usually if we're gonna freeze dry, it's because we wanna bring them back later. We don't wanna kill them permanently. Another way we can get rid of microorganisms or stop the growth is just physically remove them from whatever fluid or specimen we want them from. Instead of just trying to kill them in the fluid, let's remove them from the fluid using a filter. And I'm like, a lot of you make, may have some type of Brita filter or some type of water filter. You can buy water bottles now that have filters built in. And I'm like, those filters are there to catch. And I'm like, small microorganisms. Now they're not gonna, they generally are not meant to catch viruses at all, but they will catch larger bacteria. And so you're not killing the organisms, but you are removing them from what you're gonna drink. Now, other than just having filters that can remove organisms from fluids, there are filters that can remove microorganisms from air as well. They're HEPA filters. And I'm like, usually when we have some type of lab that we're working with organisms and microbes and we don't want contamination because the air can have bacteria in it. It's why we always keep our plates covered up in our lab. But we want to remove those microbes out of the air. There's usually a mic where if we're usually going to work in a hood. We aren't, but Arlene is. But Arlene will work in a hood. But what happens is that she'll actually turn a fan on and any of the air in the space she's working at will get sucked out and run through a HEPA filter and remove that contamination. So she doesn't have microbes falling on plates and contaminating the media. Another type of physical method is osmotic pressure. And again, this really is starting, it's, you know, it's really coming down back to water. But I'm like, the osmotic pressure, usually you're gonna use some type of high concentration of salt or sugar. Salt is the top one. Now, if you add a lot of salt to a solution that has microbes in it, what happens to those cells? What happens to those microbes in a high salt, in a hyper, because hyper means lots, a hypertonic solution? Well, if you put a bunch of microbes, I know they show red blood cells, but if you put a bunch of microbes in a hypertonic, high salt area, those microbes are gonna lose water. Well, if the microbes lose water, they can't function. It's almost like drying them out. And I'm like, and so we can add salt to create water to leave these microorganisms. It's one of the main reasons salt is used for preserving food. And I'm like, beef jerky has tons and tons of salt in it. That was because it was used to pull all that water out so that it can sustain. And I'm like, living on the shelf without water, without getting damaged and broken down from bacteria and other microbes. Now, my little note, bacteria are very susceptible to losing water, especially if you have that salt around. Fungi, though, are usually pretty tolerant of hypertonic solutions. A lot of fungi, and I'm like, it takes a lot of salt to try to remove all the water, and even then, it doesn't always kill. So bacteria are easier to kill with salt than fungi. Oops. Now, radiation is another physical method, and there's a couple different types of radiation. 
One is an ionizing radiation, just means it has really short wavelengths. Now, short enough that these actual wavelengths can penetrate and kill molecules inside of a specimen. And I'm like, it can take hours to kill, but this is showing what happens if you irradiate, and I'm like, you know, using these little ions, strawberries. Guess what? A couple weeks later, and I'm like, if you left these strawberries in, a, in your refrigerator or sitting on the shelf, most of your strawberries at home would start to look like this after a week or two. But if you killed every bacteria, every fungus, every fungal spore, everything inside and on the outside of that strawberry, nothing's going to break it down. And so I'm like, a couple weeks later, they can still like look like nice, fresh strawberries. Now, that can take a lot of time, which means then it takes a lot of money. And I'm like, so it doesn't, you know, we don't do that all the time, but I'm like, we can use ionizing radiation to kill inside of organisms. Uh, Non-ionizing radiation, and I'm like, they're longer wavelengths. They cannot penetrate into organisms, but they can be used to disinfect the air and surface objects. One of the most common non-ionizing ionizing radiation is UV light. This is also why when you walk into Walmart um, next to the carts, there's a UV light. Look on the walls. And I'm like, that UV light is there to kill microorganisms on the carts. They have little sanitary wipes now too, because you don't know how long you know the cart's been exposed to the UV light, but it does help disinfect the air and those surfaces on those carts. Now, when we are talking about different levels of bacteria to kill, there are various biosafety levels for different types of bacteria. Uh, and, I'm like, and again, the harder to kill bacteria, usually the stronger type of antimicrobial uh, substance or physical method that we'll need. But, and I'm like, when we're talking about different organisms, one, and I'm like, biosafety level number one just means you're working with organisms that don't even cause disease in a healthy human. Now, if you have a, if you're immunocompromised, you have a weak immune system, yes, then it can maybe could cause problems. This would be working with stuff we're working up in our lab. And I'm like, the bacteria that's found on your skin, not gonna cause a disease in healthy humans, but if you're immunocompromised, it might. Uh, biosafety level number two, these are moderately hazardous. That yes, they may cause slight illnesses, uh, in healthy individuals. I put the asterisk next to that because yes, there are a few in our lab that are on the biosafety level number two. And I'm like, and not only because I'm giving them to you, is because we are gonna start growing bacteria up that are living in and on you. And we are gonna be testing you all shortly, in a month-ish, uh, for strep throat. And a lot of times we have positives every semester. And I'm like, well, and I'm like, that means if someone is handling that plate and I'm like, it's moderately hazardous that you could be spreading the bacteria that can cause strep throat. So moderately hazardous. No one's dying from it, but moderately hazardous. Nothing, we do not handle anything that's in the biosafety level number three or four. Safety level number three, everything would always have to be contained in various safety cabinets, worked with under the hoods. And biosafety level number four can cause severe or fatal disease, AKA it could cause death definitely not working with any of those in our lab. This is an example in the CDC of someone working with Ebola virus cultures that yes, has about a 90% fatal uh, death rate. We do not work with those. Um, but just kind of give you an idea of what we are working with in our lab. Now, my second little group of ways we can kill microorganisms, there are physical methods and there are chemical methods. And I'm like, chemicals, and I'm like, how we use the chemicals. The chemicals are there to affect the microbe cell walls, their membranes, their proteins, DNA. Same basic places that your physical methods do. And I'm like, again, we always have to know the different environmental conditions because the different chemicals work. Some work better at certain temperatures, some work better at certain pHs, and some work better on certain sites. But we generally have some type of chemical that is effective against envelope viruses, uh, various bacteria, fungi, protozoa. It really just depends on what you're trying to kill, depends on which chemical that you grab. Now, our first group of chemicals, they are phenol and phenolics. It's one of the earliest disinfectants. Their job is to denature proteins and disrupt the cell membrane. They are commonly used in healthcare, labs, and home. Uh, one of the most common phenol that you 
may use at home is Lysol. Lysol is a weak, uh, a weak phenol. And I'm like, they're great. And I'm like, they're active for a long period of time. So you can spray a surface off and it will keep killing on that surface for a long period of time. And they generally don't have all that much uh, for side effects. And so I'm like, they're commonly used in a lot of places. Alcohols. These are intermediate level disinfectants. And I'm like, so they'll start killing some of those pathogenic organisms. And they work by denaturing proteins, disrupting that cytoplasmic membrane. And they are more effective than soap in removing bacteria from hands. It's one of the reasons we were kind of testing that. Uh, it is it is better. And like soap kind of and I'm like is used to break the bacteria up off of your hands so that they get washed off. But that phenol really is to kill the bacteria as well. It's one of the main reasons we use some type of alcohol wipe or uh, pad before in swabbing the skin before an injection. It's really to try to kill some bacteria on that site. And I'm like, before you open up a wound area. Halogens are intermediate level antimicrobials, again, killing some pathogenic bacteria. They work by damaging enzymes. Uh, they denature them, they can't work correctly, the microbe ends up dying. Places that they're used, based on that big picture, iodine. That's why that skin's all brown. Iodine is a halogen. Um, you know, like a lot of times it's treating water and any type of iodine, various types of chlorine treatments, various types of bleach. These are all halogens. Intermediate level, they don't kill everything. Bleach is really a good cleaner and disinfectant, but there are definitely things that are still resistant to it. Now there's more examples. Now, oxidizing agents. If you wanted to make sure you killed everything, like you're like, I know that we have endospore making bacteria. And I'm like, you may want to go with some type of oxidizing agent. It's that high level disinfectant. Again, it kills by oxidation. Uh, that process of losing electrons, which then becomes unstable, which then, yes, can damage the organism. Examples of oxidizing agents is hydrogen peroxide, ozone. Ozone is used to treat a lot of drinking water. If you went to a water treatment facility, even in La Crosse here, and I'm like, yep, they use an ozone uh, treatment, and I'm like, on all of their drinking water before it leaves the facility. And then parasitic acid is used to clean a lot of equipment in hospital settings. Surfactants are low-level disinfectants. Um, they're still used quite often, generally because they're not all that harmful. Uh, they reduce, their main job is to reduce surface tension of solvents. They kind of just break apart these organisms. Again, as bacteria are sticking and forming these biofilms, surfactants kind of reduce the surface tension and it kind of starts to separate them out a little bit. Common examples of surfactants are soaps and detergent that, yes, they're low level, they kill a lot of things, but they definitely don't kill all pathogenic organisms, and they definitely don't kill endospore organisms. But they're used to reduce surface tension. That's why a lot of soaps and detergent are also used in combination with something like an alcohol. It increases your chance of killing organisms. Um, quats is a really common type of surfactant, a disinfectant. Uh, that's used in medical facilities and dust industries. It's a low-level disinfectant, but it, it's there just just disrupt the cellular membrane, kind of breaks apart those phospholipids from each other. <laughs> quats is short for quaternary ammonia ions. Weed is shorted to quats. Heavy metals are low-level bacteriostatic and fungi static. So it's killing not just bacteria but fungi. Uh, now, and I'm like, they work by denaturing proteins, various examples of heavy metals that are used, uh, silver nitrite thimerosal. Now, thimerosal is the heavy metal that is used to preserve vaccines. It's also the big one where everyone's like, oh, it does cause, um, you know, problems and autism with vaccines. Vaccines don't cause autism. There's yet to be a study that says it does. Now, thimerosal is a heavy metal. However, it is in so, such a small quantity um, in these vaccines, it's meant so that these vaccines don't go bad. And I'm like, because we don't want to be giving any type of individual that has a fluid that is contaminated with bacteria. And so I'm like, or any type of fungus. And so it keeps bacteria and fungus out. 
And I'm like, but yes, there's the big, you know, debate is that's where they're saying autism comes from. My note, you, if you're like, well, that's why I'm not vaccinated, uh, you can go to the doctor and ask for any particular vaccine to not have thym thimerosal in it. They make some with and they make some without. Generally more expensive, and I'm like, if you have it without, but you can still ask for it. Um, copper is used, usually if you're trying to control some type of algae growth, if that's a possibility in whatever you're trying to disinfect. Aldehydes are high-level disinfectants when you're trying to kill those um, major endospore organisms. Uh, what makes them an aldehyde is if we drew out the big chemical formula for it, it would have a carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen group on the end. They work by denaturing proteins, inactivating nucleic acids, the DNA. Common aldehydes are glutaraldehyde and formalin, commonly known as formaldehyde. Now, formaldehyde is stronger and more effective, but then they also found out that formaldehyde was also cancerous. And so we don't use formaldehyde anymore, um, but we do use a little bit weaker, um, it seems, still seems to work just as well, of substance called formalin. Now, this is why, yes, I've got my little jars of preserved organisms that your high school science teacher or middle school science teacher probably had a whole, you know, shelf of them. Now, the reason why these things can sit in these fluids, the fluids are aldehydes. It's the formalin or it's a glutaraldehyde. And I'm like, which means there's no bacteria, there's no fungus, there's nothing in there that would ever break down these organisms. So they're in a sterile environment. So nothing's breaking them down and they can sit on the shelf for decades. Uh, we could use gaseous agents, usually some type of high level disinfectant, killing microbes and endospore organisms. It uses, it works by denaturing proteins and DNA. Now, top reasons when we use gas to sterilize, um, it's usually in hospitals and dental offices, but it's usually if we're trying to sterilize tubes. Tubes where we don't want fluid going through because the fluid would never dry. Um, and, and I'm like, but yet we still need to get inside of a whole tube. So if you're thinking the rubber tubes that are used for various things, we would use a gas. The gas can get all the way through those rubber tubes without causing any after side effect. Um, and if we're trying to, to sterilize really small instruments, we don't want them to rust. And I'm like, so we don't want some type of um, chemical that you would spray on there, but usually small delicate instruments is. Problem with gaseous, because you're like, well, why wouldn't we just use gaseous agents for everything? Um, is one, they're generally hazardous, explosive, poisonous, and can be carcinogenic. And so there has to be a trained professional that can use these gaseous agents for disinfecting various things. And then there's enzymes, almost to the end. And I'm like, enzymes? And I'm like, we, there are antimicrobial enzymes. Their main job, yes, is to break down microbes. Uh, one of them is called a lysozyme. It's a digester. If you think of it, the lysosome is there to break up food and dead and dying organelles. Well, lysozyme is also breaking things down. But this is an enzyme that breaks down the cell wall of bacteria, which means the bacteria cell wall will not work. Uh, and so we have lysozymes that are really there to kill bacteria by breaking down their cell wall. And we also now have a prionzyme that is used to help break down these prion proteins that we'll talk about later. And then the last antimicrobial slide that I have is just anytime we're using antimicrobials to treat a disease, because they can be used to treat or prevent diseases. Um, some of them are used for outside the body. Obviously, soap is used for outside of the body. And I'm like, the ones we're getting into in our next unit that we want to treat inside the body is when we get an antimicrobial drugs. So we have antimicrobials to kill on surfaces of the body. We have antimicrobials to kill inside the body. Problem with either of them, the overuse of antimicrobials, whether it's to treat surfaces, whether it's to treat inside the body, is now promoting resistant microbes. It's what that video we've been watching in lab has been showing. The more we use antimicrobials, the more resistant these bacteria are. They are figuring out ways around all the antimicrobials that we throw at them. The more we throw at them, the more ways they're going to figure it out. So it's kind of, it, they're great to use, but only when they're necessary. 
Um, our next unit, we'll talk about, you know, this next chapter that we'll talk about in lecture goes over some of the antimicrobial drugs, the antibiotics, um, and yes, how some of that resistance is happening. But we'll end right there.